All right. Great. Um, welcome, everybody. Sorry. Um, actually, the main speaker today will be my co-founder, uh, also author and maintainer of Flex Measures, Felix Klassen, who's, uh, I think, trying to get online uh, right now. We have a very busy day over here at the uh, Saita Energy Flexibility, the, the startup that uh, wrote Flex Measures in the first place a couple of years ago and is still writing it uh, continuously. Uh, but it's my job actually to give a little intro to this first kind of developer training that we do for Flex Measures. And I'm really happy that there's a, a turnout. Um, actually, the idea was that uh, in the Flex Measures um, Slack channel, that two developers who, for their respective startups, are looking into uh, running Flex Measures themselves and, and optimizing their own energy solutions for their own customers with Flex Measures, uh, came up with very specific situations and questions, which in the uh, said Slack channel we've been answering, and everybody of you is uh, invited to join over there as well. I think you have to basically search for LF Energy and Slack, and then that's a whole organization, Slack organization that you can join, and within there you find a few channels. Also, uh, I think every project has one, and FlexMeters also has one. Um, but there in this Slack conversations, the idea was born to maybe do a session like this uh, to actually answer a couple of questions uh, right away. And it, it was also the case that some of these questions I answered uh, by actually asking Felix in the back. I'm, I I wrote a lot of code and text measures and I still do code review, uh, which you can check online, but actually Felix knows some more things about how the optimization works. So flex measures does include algorithms and Felix knows more about that. Felix just joined us here. Welcome. Uh, welcome Ragnar, who was one of the two developers and Yelma was the other one. I'm not sure I see him here. Uh, he did actually sign up for this. Um, a few others signed up. Uh, and I'm suspecting that a few, that we have a mixed audience today. So for instance, Ragnar is already working with Flex Measures. And I think Tanil has been working with Flex Measures as well, if I'm not mistaken. But we might have some that are that tuned in to basically uh, learn what it is. Um, let me know if the latter assumption is wrong. Uh, how do we do that? <laughs> um, I'm assuming that a couple of you are here to learn what Flex Measures is from the ground up, and it would be worthwhile for me to spend a few minutes uh, as an introduction. If there's, uh, yeah, I, I'm seeing some thumbs up of people who would like that, I guess. Okay, that's great. Then, as, a, as we said, we're quite, I have a very busy week over here, um, but I'm getting out. Oh, Yelmer is there too. Hey, Yelmer. Sorry, for, sorry, for, uh, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> no problem. I'm, I'm basically I'm boring you now with a couple of minutes of introduction what Flexmeros is. Before uh, we actually, the design would be that actually you and uh, uh, Ragnar might bring up an example, like like we do on the Slack channel. Basically, the idea would be that one part of this session is uh, to do what we do in the Slack channel, but actually live, to, to discuss actual problems that um, organizations, people have that pick up Flex measures, which is something that we cannot imagine as we have been working on and with Flex measures for a couple of years now. So we need this, this a different perspective, uh, maybe also with the group. Maybe we can uh, then, try to leave some time for general questions as well from the rest of the audience who might be um, in a different state. Let me just share my screen to go through a couple slides. So recently I was at the uh, LF Energy Summit in Brussels and uh, gave 
something like of, of like a demo or an introduction over there, and I'm going to use these slides. Um, yeah. All right, flex measures. Um, what is it and for who? That's something I'm trying to answer within a few minutes. There is a toy tutorial and actually a, a, a tutorial made up of a few steps within the documentation. And I will just briefly go through that here. I will not actually uh, type it from scratch. But we actually advise everybody who's new to maybe touch on that to get a little bit of a feel for it. It should only take a few minutes to set up. Um, and then I think I'll hand over. If anybody uh, questions who is actually the originating organization behind Flexibility, that's, that's us, SITA Energy Flexibility. Um, and the two founders are in this call. Maybe even some of our team members who uh, have time. It's a very engineering heavy uh, startup. Uh, founded already early on. We did a lot of projects for a few years and are now turning this over into uh, offering less project-based approaches and more products, uh, and which are actually all based on flex measures. So that's flex measures is the technology we use for everything. And what could flex measures be described as? Uh, at the LF Energy Summit, I tried this analogy that uh, you can build actually a lot of nice things with it. It comes with a lot of batteries included. It comes with an API included, uh, command line interfaces included, algorithms included. But uh, our whole idea was that um, energy services all need energy flexibility in the next 10 or 15 years. We really make use of energy flexibility, but uh, the situation on the ground always slightly differs in the kind of assets you see there and the kind of constraints you see. For instance, in the Netherlands, it's uh, um, grid congestion is a major constraint that needs to be taken care of in other countries it's not. Dynamic prices also just comes up in a couple of countries. If you go to EV charging, the situation will always slightly differ or differ in a big way. If you go to Africa, then uh, e-mobility is not uh, big passenger cars or uh, trucks, but it might be just uh, smaller vehicles and, and so on, but it might it will also happen. So we want flex measures to be a toolkit something generic that works out of the box for a lot of things, but you can actually build it to fit your own energy service ideas. It has a behind the meter focus. So that's what we uh, believe is the right way to start, to look behind the meter of a site and then look outwards, for instance, to the dynamic energy tariff, grid congestion or grid services. It, we see uh, value in focusing on storage, so the energy flexibility that sits in storage, in batteries, electric vehicles, and we also work with um, heat batteries, let's say, hot water storage for heat pumps, for instance. Um, and the, the algorithm we've worked the most with, and that's currently also um, getting new features, is that storage planner, the storage scheduler. It is a, it works as an EMS, but in terminology, we use cloud EMS because you also have a lot of things in the EMS world that do different things. For instance, sit right on site and actually physically talk to assets. Um, this might be called site EMS. But FlexMeter is uh, purely a cloud EMS. It sits in the cloud and calculates uh, optimized schedules. We have a couple of projects where we use FlexMeter in, in, in different sectors uh, as shown here. I will not go in all. We will not go into a lot of examples here. You can always hit me up um, on LinkedIn or well, on LF Energy Slack to talk more about these. Um, Black measures is more of a backend, but you see here that we also do some visualizations. Um, for instance, there's a this is part of a playback feature where you put together this dashboard and you see this black line there that represents uh, 
now. And when we hit that replay button, uh, we have JavaScript that uh, shows you how the time progresses and what information was available to speculators at that time, what kind of measurements, but mostly which forecasts of future were available and what plans of the battery at that time. All right, and now what we believe uh, for who flex measures is a good fit is the innovative uh, builders of energy services. It's mostly you find them in startups, we believe. Uh, and, and in our world right now, um, buildings become more energy aware and smart, and that's that's so clear until that we like to partner with. Process industry is also very interesting, but just from my perspective, difficult to uh, build partnerships with it. But that's really what it depends on. It depends less on the technology, but more on the partnerships you can build. Okay, I will now go a little bit more into the tech uh, or the data modeling, but I will try not to go too deep. Main concepts you'll find in flex measures in the data model would be these three. Um, I mean, we also have, of course, we model users and accounts uh, and a few other things, but the main uh, models we want to work with are that we model assets. So that's really devices, but you could also uh, model your whole building as an asset and then have children assets in there in the whole hierarchy so that you have a building asset and there is a battery asset in there and solar asset and so on. And for each asset that deals with any data, you would define sensors that live on the assets and each sensor stores time series data, which we call beliefs. Uh, beliefs could be uh, about the future. So time series data is often about the future. In, in this sense, in text measures, the, the ones that really matters are, because the main thing that text measures deliver is schedules optimized for an uncertain future. So that's time series data about the future. Beliefs what might be optimal, uh, but also forecasts, beliefs what might happen uh, and we've also been working on making possible to do reports with speculators. So, for instance, on energy costs, if you um, accumulated uh, power measurements and market prices, where the market would be another sort of asset, a public asset, well, then, of course, you want to uh, deliver to the customer what were my energy costs, and uh, that's basically a multiplication of these two sensors. Something like that is um, supported also. But most importantly, some algorithms are included. Um, the one for storage devices, as I just mentioned, is the one we use most and work on most. Uh, we have a simple one for processes, and VPPs um, might have a unique representation next year because uh, in a in the R&D project here in the Netherlands, we have funding to transfer a proven algorithm that can that is mostly fitted for VPPs into flex measures. Actually, we are hiring uh, a developer for that. They have, they have to be in the Netherlands uh, to start as soon as possible. Might take a couple months until we're ready to really announce that and it's ready to be used. Okay, finally, a little bit about uh, what awaits you if you uh, run through the toy tutorial. The toy tutorial um, tries to start as small as possible so that within minutes you've used black measures to make a schedule. Um, and it uses the command line interface of flex measures. You could do the same with uh, black measures API, but at the time of writing the tutorial, we thought that is maybe a bit too cumbersome. We, we need to we, we do it as small as possible. So you don't have to run the flex measures server in the background or anything. Since then, we have written a flex measures client. So then the tutor tutorial could, in principle, be um, as succinct as we're doing it now, but not on the command line, but basically uh, in, in a Python script that imports flex measures client and then really uses these client functions, which 
in the back would talk to a Beckenbauer server. But let me just walk through this a little bit. Um, so what we want to do in this very first auditorial is uh, to take a battery, uh, take some crisis that might happen the next day, and then ask the flex measure scheduler what would be the perfect schedule if that battery is only there to optimize energy costs, optimize buy and sell energy. Um, we've actually made a, a command line um, command line is based, uh, what would we say, command line command just for putting together an, uh, an account for this purpose, an account that has a couple assets. And that would be a couple of lines of code that we uh, didn't think were helpful. This is just uh, easy to find in the text message code. Uh, and when you run this command, it actually tells you what it does at the account, at the user, at a building asset, at a battery asset under the building, at a public uh, market asset, and at a sensors, for instance, a sensor for the prices, and so on. And the next command is where we actually tell flex measures that there are certain prices. So we will make a, a CSV with prices. Uh, that's also somewhere in the toy tutorial, very simple um, Unix command, just echo a couple of prices into the CSV file, and, and here's how we load it, adding the beliefs. Uh, and actually on the command line interface, we even, can even look at data. I mean, usually you would use the web interface, I think, but uh, this is a neat way if you, for instance, work on the FlexMeter server and you're on some terminal with no direct access right now to UI, you can actually look at data this way. So these are the prices uh, that have been just loaded. This is how it would look like in the web UI. And all that has to be uh, has to happen to compute that optimized schedule for the battery is to uh, call this command, which is akin to an API call that you could also make. So we say there's a specific sensor, uh, which is the battery battery's power sensor number two, and we have also a sensor where the prices are stored number one. We tell you when the schedule should start, how long it should be, what we assume the battery to be at the beginning, the round trip efficiency of the battery. These are all things that um, are part of what we call the flex measures, uh, flex context and flex model. You'll find actually uh, that also documented in the, in the flex measures documentation or read the docs. And all these things can be sent to FlexMeasures API as well. And for convenience, we're working on that right now that you can um, store some of these on the assets themselves, which if, you, if you're not planning to change them ever, then uh, you can spare yourself from sending them to the API. So in this case, the schedule was uh, made right away. You see there the uh, corresponding endpoint in the Flex model that would be sent um, of course, this will actually do the computation running a linear programming model right away in the same process. We can also defer that to a queue. Uh, in the CLI, it would be the uh, dash dash as dash job parameter, but uh, the API also does that usually. Yeah. The API needs to return the request right away, and maybe the computation takes a little bit too long, so that's uh, handled asynchronously. So in this case, uh, we can watch uh, what the schedule will be. We can uh, look at it in the dashboard. So it catches some of the lower prices, catches some price differences. Not very exciting in this case. Um, and I just want to mention that this was just the first tutorial, what the most easy thing you can do, but then you have actually run flex measures. Um, this, there's a second stage, I think we have four or five stages where we introduce slightly uh, newer things. And here's one example, we introduce that there's solar power. 
so here you see the production of the um, solar power on that day. And in addition to that, um, a restriction on the whole site's um, production capacity, I think. So then you see when you when I go back and forth that with solar present, the battery has to limit itself. So the highest peaks during the time that solar is uh, being produced have to be lowered to take this additional constraint into account. So now I won't go into the details how you tell factors that, but it's basically the same way of adding some parameters here. Um, telling flex measures that there's another constraint to be taken into account for the, the maximum uh, production capacity, for instance. So uh, taking solar into account, that works. I would stop here. So this is basically roughly half of the uh, presentation I gave at the LF Energy Summit. I'm, I was talking about a lot of other interesting things like our uh, vehicle to grid uh, project that is basically a front end that is running uh, i think a dozen nissan leaves at this point in which this is just demonstrating how a front end uses flex measures at the back end as you see on the lower left reports being created by flex measures on the bottom middle graph you see the schedules that flex measures is making for the car being represented here in the yellow line and on the right you see uh, that reservations that users make so their car has to be charged at some time to some minimum state of charge, which are also fed into flex measures as um, you know, additional constraints to the scheduling. Set points, uh, so to say, minimum charge at some point in time. Um, and then later on the presentation, I'm talking about other features like plugins, for instance, but I think that... Um, it would be best to stop here and, and go to the next part, which is um, that maybe Yelmar and uh, Ratner have have uh, some specific questions. That would be interesting. Yeah, you can, so if you're working on as as far as you're uh, willing to to share. Of course, it's it's it might be confidential, but uh, let's see if we can find a good middle ground. Yeah, so maybe if I may start, uh, I have a yeah, Spe yeah, reasonably specific question. First of all, um, I really like the uh, the product, so I think it's very uh, useful. Uh, you mentioned the uh, congestion problems uh, we're dealing with in uh, the Netherlands, and I think uh, these kinds of tools are quite necessary to. Um, come up with uh, solutions. So um, yeah, great, uh, great uh, initiative, uh, especially to, to make uh, something like this uh, available open source. Um, and yeah, I've, I've been uh, like, I, I wanted to say playing around, but a bit more than that, I've been testing things out uh, with flex measures and uh, see if it uh, can fulfill uh, our use case. And um, uh, I have uh, uh, quite a simple uh, question. And the demo you, you gave, uh, that's uh, basically um, a system where you uh, generate a schedule for a battery. Um, and its goal is to like optimize uh, profits, uh, basically. So it it uh, charges uh, when when there's when the prices are uh, are are low from the grid, and it uh, discharges when when the prices are uh, yeah uh, are higher. Right? Am I uh, do I understand that uh, correctly? Or yeah, yeah, that that is correct. Yeah. So and the thing we are looking for is not 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 really. Uh, this pricing uh, thing, but more uh, uh, clients who are dealing with this uh, congestion uh, issues, and they are uh, looking to uh, like to shave demand peaks. So 
uh, they want to optimize uh, the battery for uh, for charging so that it takes the peaks in demand uh, into account and also the limit for for grid uh, inputs import so um, for example a client wants to um, charge evs but uh, with its current grid capacity it's not possible and we want to yeah run uh, some uh, simulations to find out what kind of the battery would be able to yeah fulfill uh, fulfill that demand that peak demand um and I, I noticed that uh, yeah so by default flex measures in its demo or toy setup it optimizes for cost um is it possible to to give the goal of minimizing unmet demand um and and how would i yeah do that <laughs> not sure if it's it's in scope here or but uh yeah it's definitely in scope uh, i would say um currently the, the the official flex measures release that we have out now still uses site capacities as uh, hard constraints and that means that um if if it's possible if the scheduler sees that it's possible to stay under, then it will, and it will give you a schedule that stays under the site capacities. However, if it's unpreventable to go over a site capacity, then the scheduler will do nothing. It will fail. Yeah. Um, and in those cases, what you really want is to still see um, a battery do the best that it can to stay as close uh, as it can to, uh, to, to limit the breach. Yeah. Um, so there is a uh, pull request in an advanced stage that does exactly that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was I was aware of this pull request, but it does exactly this. Okay. That that's good to know. Um, I think it's worthwhile to to mention the uh, hierarchy, right? So we have it's an optimization problem, and yeah. then you have uh, hard constraints, and you have optimization goals, which are yeah, well, by, by definition, software. Mm -hmm. So for, until now, we have put in um, capacity constraints as hard constraints that the scheduler, uh, I mean, and I would place those then at the top, actually. Yeah. They cannot be breached. Uh, it, um, you cannot optimize for prices and then maybe breach the capacity constraints it's it's a top level constraint and you, you could say that then foremost if you give a constraint flex measures will really stay within and if you also give um then some optimization goal like prices but we've used co2 before uh, flex measures data model has no problem with that then within that tough uh, constraint it would then also give you the the best uh, well, CO2 performance or so, but yes, uh, capacity constraints are high level. This is yeah. long enough. <clears throat> Given that uh, Yelmer is trying to simulate how big battery would be useful to solve this problem, mm -hmm. he doesn't have to have the, the, the constraints as hard constraints, right? Because he's not trying to actually run it with that battery. He's just trying to figure out you know, how big battery do I need to sort of do better? And is that better good enough to sort of like make the investment worth or something like that? So if he removes the hard constraints and put in a consumption as the optimization factor that he wants to flatten out mm -hmm. as much as possible, I think he would get a decent answer. He cannot run, but he can at least sort of saying, oh, in this scenario, I need a battery of 60 kilowatts, and that's too expensive. Oh, in this scenario, I need a battery of 20 kilowatts. Okay, this might be sort of like worth going to continue. Now, of course, it's a little bit dangerous to sort of have, have some software that you cannot actually <laughs> make the schedule when you go live. But theoretically, he, he's not stuck waiting for the pull request. Okay, but... Yeah, I can also check the branch out of the pull request and, and see uh, um, see if that works. So, but there might be other ways. For instance, um, yeah, but... we have a big battery that mm -hmm. uh, that helps you resolve all that, simulate that, and then you can check uh, what was its highest. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you have no price 
um, incentive. So you set a constant price. So the battery has no incentive to do anything else but to prevent the capacity breaches. Yeah. And then you could check uh, in, in the results what was the the highest state of charge that it ever had. Yeah. Uh, that would give you an indication. But actually, I, we discussed this on the Slack channel, and Felix had an opinion about uh, Ragnar's idea. I, I, if you remember, Felix, that's something. Oh, no, I have to, have to look that up. But uh, yeah. putting yeah. constant prices into the problem is, I think, definitely a, a good idea. OK, yeah. Uh, I think I mentioned that it probably should be a positive price. Uh, not, not a price of zero or a negative price. And the reason for that is that um, there are conversion losses, or if you're talking about a battery years, round trip losses. Um, and if those are priced negatively, for example, then it actually, the, the battery will try to make a loss uh, in, in terms of energy to make a profit in terms of money. So put a positive constant price into the problem, um, then I think you will be able to um, get a battery that schedules or, uh, or tries to optimize self-consumption. Especially yeah. if the production price is a little bit lower than the consumption price. That means that it's always good to reduce consumption and that would be a better choice than to increase production because reducing consumption is worth more than increasing production. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, and then I think, one... I think Rachna is right that you could uh, take out the site capacity constraint if, mm -hmm. if you're actually um, yeah, getting in scenarios where uh, this is causing the battery to not uh, to not give out a schedule, so that, that is indeed something to try. But maybe I may be missing uh, things. But the way I see this constraints, for example, uh, a grid import limit at a certain uh, time when there's a peak, um, then. Part of that demand is is filled using grid imports. Uh, part of it, if it's during the day, may be filled with uh, of, yeah, uh, met using uh, uh, PV uh, production, and yeah, the remainder is being um, met using uh, battery discharge. Um, when you leave uh, those capacity constraints, um, how does the system then, or how does this work with the amount of yeah? energy that can be imported from the grid? Is that something you would handle elsewhere? Yeah, in some other, in some other way or? Um... Um, what? It will try to minimize the amount of consumption taken from the grid um, mm -hmm. if the consumption price is higher. Yeah. So yeah, it, even without uh, the hard constraint, you should mm -hmm. get um, a policy that tries to reduce the imports. So now we're not talking about removing the grid constraint completely, or are we? Uh, it, it's just softening it. So it... No, yeah, we were exploring the option of uh, losing the grid constraint entirely. Yeah, but I have a feeling that yeah, using the version that's uh yeah becomes available uh after this pr gets uh, will be merged eventually that will simplify things a bit right i believe so yes yeah. because in yeah. that case we will have we will still have a hard constraint for the physical capacity to the site mm -hmm. um but a soft constraint for the contracted capacity and uh, what we believe in is uh to we, we also deal with simulations uh, Saita, as i show, showed on the slides before and we believe in simulating as close to uh, a reality as possible so i think it has great value later and for the outcomes if we simulate what we would actually run if this uh, the model site would actually be starting to connect and then really work 
uh, use the same kind of modeling is, is an approach we, we try to practice. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think I have uh, quite some input to, um, yeah, to work with. Um, made some notes. I have next. another question, but I'm, I'm not sure if someone uh, wants to go next. I have a, a, a small question, which I think might be a little bit easier. Um, but first of all, um, I also want to say um, I, I'm impressed by the work and it's not easy to, to, to create open source and document it and building a community. So thanks to Seta uh, to, to, to do this work. Uh, my question is, is, is rather simple and that is that I have assets that have been sort of already created and they exist in some other system outside of Flex. Uh, and of course they have some kind of a unique identifier uh, that, that is used in that system. And um, in Flex, the, the, the unique ID of, is of course picked by Flex. So it, it's guaranteed to be unique, the identifier or the ID. And the, the name is not forced to be unique and it's sort of pretty to use uh, in, in the user interface. And so um, um, I now have to sort of create a mapping table between um, the flex unique ID and, and uh, uh, outside unique ID. And it would be interesting to see, it would be nice if flex could have a, a secondary sort of unique ID or a mapping table. So you don't you didn't have to sort of like do this and i don't think it's an unusual situation i think there are many systems that would have that uh it, it, have i missed something that i there's another way of doing it or does this question make sense or request make sense i think it definitely makes sense this request um i mean also i've just this morning i've been working on an integration with uh with someone that has sensor data in home assistant where you have different IDs than in the flex measure system. So that is a situation that comes up uh, more often. And indeed, then we have to make uh, a mapping. Um, one way of at least storing the mapping is using the uh, attributes column of the asset. Yes, I've been, I've been playing with that. Uh, uh, the, uh, the nice part, with, I mean, that solves the database problem. It um, uh, in the user interface, if someone wants to search on it, it's a little bit hard because yeah, the, exactly. the attributes are not being used for any of the of, of those kinds of things. But it is a start, yeah. and uh, I appreciate that idea. Um, Another question I have is also a little, a little bit about the optimizer, and I'm very interested in 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 the new uh, PR that I saw where you're adding adding these capabilities for for um, uh, peak tariff or towards that um, goal. But my problem is simpler. Um, you have a system that have um, a battery and it has local production. And usually in prices, there is a difference between sell price and buy price. If you just put in two prices, the battery will do arbitrage for selling and buying out on the grid. Mm -hmm. But you would like to also look at optimizing self-use, which might or might not be better, depending on how the price differentiation uh, happens over time and what the actual consumptions are. Because if you have low consumptions, you might not use the battery if only doing self um, uh, self use. And so this would be very similar, I think, to that um, request because when when the battery is charging from self production, you can view it that the cost is not the grid buy cost. The cost is actually the grid sell cost that the local production would have made if the battery didn't uh, charge the overconsumption or the self-production, if that I think that should sense. be the model, right? That um, you, if you can feed into the grid, which uh, we have uh, like half the cases we work with, you can and half you can't, 
But if there's a production capacity uh, larger than zero, then the scheduler should take into account that yes, you could uh, put power on the grid and you would actually be paid that amount of money. And in general, we assume that uh, solar power is available at zero marginal costs. We only care about OPEX uh, in phase measures. So it should be possible. I think that I think that the that the solar is is available for zero cost is e economically not I mean sort of like depending on how you want to model it but if you want to optimize the money that you are making from it I think that is not the right model because the solar if it gets sold would make money if the battery mm -hmm. takes that it has a logical cost and when it wants to discharge, it needs to discharge at a better price. Otherwise, this was uh, charging the battery didn't make sense. Maybe you, you uh, there's two things. One is the what is the best activity in uh, what the best schedule, and the other would be how you report. No, this is all a scheduling thing. Should I sell? Because the price, if there's a huge price spike, if it goes to you know ten euros and I and I bought it for half a euro, yeah, you know what? Sell it. You're going to make tons of money. But if the if the prices are 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 not jumping very much, it might be more beneficial economically to uh, charge the battery and and move it in time and and discharge it for self use. I think. And um, that actually touches on something we see sometimes uh, about after my schedule is done, what would be the assumed value of power I have in the battery for later? So then it actually, I think this, this might be it. So we have that also with um, simulations of electric vehicle charging. That's even more complicated that you want to charge the vehicles of your customers on the parking lot or your employees on the parking lot. Um, but what is the what is your assumed value of having given them this uh, these kilowatt hours in their cars? And then we actually in the in these simulations for, for reporting the end results, we said um, or I think even in the simulations, we said the value of kilowatt hours having been put into an employee car uh, is assumed to be the value that they pay us or the value that they would have to pay when they go to a public charger. And in this I case, think that the thing... value is a more complex question. Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> I think if you ask what was the cost to charge the battery, I think that's a much easier question because you know exactly what it was. Either it came from the grid with the grid buy price, or it came from self-production where the missing revenue is the grid sell price. That's exactly the difference in, in money. And it's yeah. delayed, right? Since the battery is a storage. You might then sell it from the battery later, or you might use it yourself. And when you use it yourself, then uh, you are avoiding buying from the grid, which has a value. And so I, I believe it's actually very similar to the, the, the PR1144, the pull request 1144. It, the only difference here is that instead of a one cost or, t uh, or t over time, it's sort of like the current, uh, what you're passing in, you're passing in is the grid, uh, are you buying or selling from the grid? And that is flipping the price for buy or sell. I think that there's a conceptual misunderstanding somewhere because the, um, the buy and sell price are being included in the problem and they are being attached to uh, or yeah, assigned to uh, the consumption and production on the, on the grid connection point. Yes. And that includes um, the power coming from the solar system. Well, yes, but the interesting part here, there's actually two buy prices and two sell prices, right? Why? Okay, so let me do some very simple numbers. I, they, they have nothing to do with reality, right? So let's say for the fun of it, for, for a unit of energy, my buy price from the grid is two euros. 
and my sell cost from the grid is one euro. So there mm -hmm. is a difference here between uh, the two prices of one euro, right? Yeah. That basically means that if, if I charging the battery from the grid, the cost is two euro. And if I sell it, I make one euro. Your algorithm mm -hmm. takes that to effect because your algorithm is an arbitrage algorithm and it's optimizing it. If it happens to be that I have solar production and the solar production is larger than the consumption of the facility or the consumption of the house or whatever you want to say, yeah. there is now energy that is going to be sold to the grid for one euro. If that gets put into the battery, that energy only costs the battery one euro. And when I'm looking at the algorithm and you're passing in buy and sell price, and the cost of, of, of and and the constraints of of the 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 house, Wait, you don't look you at just that. Said that. That putting the solar in the battery directly costs you one euro. Yes, because if the solar would have been sold to the grid because there was extra capacity, so I could sell. It's mm -hmm. not being used up by my toaster or anything else that I don't control, right? Or lights or, you know, the oven or whatever, right? If I had a choice of selling it, I would have made one euro for that energy amount, okay. which is cheaper than loading from the grid. So, of course, I want to stuff it into the battery. Now, the question is, when do I want to discharge? Do I want to sell because the prices went to five euros? Or do I want to wait until I have some consumption for the grid and the price is higher than one euro? And which of those two choices are the best? Yeah. So I, I think then this is a question about the scheduling horizon in a sense, because if if it's within the scope of the, the horizon of the scheduling problem, then you have the prices to take into account. But at the end of your scheduling horizon, um, there is some energy in your battery that has some value for some expected value for after the, the scheduling horizon. And that that is missing from the scheduler. I think this is the problem you are facing. What I'm the problem I'm facing is that there are two prices dependent on at the same time dependent on if uh, I am over if I have a choice of selling or not selling, or if I have a choice of buying or not buying. <clears throat> and I don't think it has anything to do with Horizon. This is a decision that, mm. this is very similar to, to, I mean, or maybe I'm, I'm, I'm misunderstanding terms. And to me, it's sort of like, it's very common that you're having a, hey, Google, a good night. local production and, 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 and a storage, right? And so I think that, if you start thinking about that the cost of, 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 of production, local production is not zero, it makes a lot more sense. So we are pricing the cost of local production against the grid price, but you see a need to price it at a second price which is corresponding to some value you perceive of storing that uh, production and for uh, to be sold or, or used at a later time. Well, or, or maybe I'm not very good at explaining this. Make it very simple. Let's assume that you're only looking at local production and local consumption of, of, of your battery. Actually, let me see here if that makes sense. Yes, it does, okay. So now you're trying to, to, to shift uh, when you're using the local production, right? What prices would you use for that? The cost to charge would be what the local production would sell to. And the cost of use would be uh, the, the, ben the, the, the benefit is how much you avoid not paying, right? So you now have flipped buy and sell prices. 
is it an idea to um, um, actually put this down into a discussion on flex measures so we can continue that conversation there? I think that this is maybe more complex things that we should we should we should, we should take this um, 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 uh, uh, off. I have maybe a simpler question. Um, I think that forecasting is. I've seen some limits, or am I mis maybe misunderstanding it? That can only forecast for forty-eight hours. That I do not know by heart. Actually, there are some horizons, probably fixed horizons that you can use. Ah, but it's only the horizon that is fixed, not necessarily for how long you forecast. I uh, I would have to look it up. My 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 thinking was if you have something that uh, you are um, uh, you have a sensor with a very low uh, resolution, like a sensor that has something every day, <laughs> then I was curious if you could forecast um, um, then sort of forecasting for longer periods makes sense. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see that uh, the horizon uh, option is limited to uh, a couple of choices, and forty eight is the the max choice at the moment. Yeah, and it makes sense to have that dependent on the sensor resolution. I agree. We're actually about to uh, revamp the forecasting infrastructure a bit. Uh, actually, the developer who works on, with that a lot is also here, Mohamed. And what you're working with is something we used uh, earlier on. So I'm happy that you got it to work. But uh, we also ran into limitations with it and decided uh, it, ne it needs a bit of an upgrade. Yeah, it, it it's sort of like when you learn it, it it's nice that you can uh, you know you come up with with improvements, and um, um, but so far it it does decent forecasting uh, for me at least uh, the weather um, um, uh, regressions regressors and the seasonality is 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 doing okay. Well, that's good to hear. <clears throat> All right, anybody else with a prepared question or a question that came up um, by being introduced to black mirrors in the first place. Yes, yeah, so, so I have another question. Um, it's not so much about uh, things I ran into when using it. It's more that I was um, uh, inspired by the, its possibilities. So this was a LinkedIn post, uh, I think, posted by your company, uh, highlighting a case that deals with uh, the uh, um, uh, re renew renewable uh, fuel units we have in uh, in the Netherlands. It's it's an important <clears throat> yeah subsidy thing, and yeah it makes this uh, yeah it's an interesting use case. So um, I'm wondering yeah can you explain a bit how if if this uh, if, if such a case uh, will be possible to model using flex measures, uh, or or if there's yeah any other or 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 if it's out of scope for this the system in its current state, um, and if so, yeah, can you maybe uh, like high level uh, explain the steps in how you you dealt with this because uh, yeah. Um, it's quite interesting. Yeah, there definitely was a nice little uh, sub project to uh, get those calculations going. Uh, especially, I mean, the, the hard part there was considering, um, yeah, the renewable uh, fuel units that went through the battery. So all of yeah. the instantaneous units are quite easily to cal easy to calculate what yeah. comes out of your PV and goes directly into your um, electric mobility. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the units that went through the battery, you have to come up with a a system of <clears throat> tracking them. Yeah. And then you also come across some choices um, with regards to uh, how to assign losses uh, proportionally to the contents of the battery. For example, if 75% of your battery is green and 25% of your battery is uh, coming from gray power, um, and you you take a loss, um, how do you assign that loss? Do you first pretend to uh, uh, lose only your gray energy and always keep your uh, green energy at the max? 
or do we do do we do it proportionally? Here, um, um, I'm sharing yeah, from yeah. a recent presentation I gave, and so the, here's a graph. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's Dutch. Sorry about that. But there's um, a graph that where we've plotted the result. Um, you see oh. state of charge of the battery in the upper graph, and then actually the amount of power in that battery or in that state of charge that has uh, come from the local solar. Yeah. And the and maybe you have to to explain for everybody who um, has heard about this. Basically, this is a, a subsidy where you get you generate green certificates if you charge um, vehicles with your own solar power. Basically, uh, that's a, a subsidy on uh, renewable fuel. Basically, uh, so the subsidy for yeah having your local installation of solar and your local immobility, but it's usually only being tracked what happens simultaneously going from the solar panels right in your cars. And I think at, at this seminar, I actually asked an expert in the audience if he thinks what we're doing here will work with these um, subsidies. Yeah, it's, interesting. It's, it's, yeah. And, so, and what was his answer? Um, but actually, um, I had to actually ask him for email later on, but I have to email yeah. him where he said, yes, what, that should work. I guess. Yeah. It, you have to show a paper trail like this. It is saying I'm yeah. keeping track of it, and you can check my method, but um, that should work. So yeah. the expert was from a big, uh, from EV consult, bigger consultancy. Yeah. Uh... And in terms of implementation details, at yeah. the moment I don't remember. Uh, I have to really look back at this project to see how I did it. I think um, I ran a reporter across the uh, measured state of charge and the power flows of the solar uh, and electric mobility um, yeah. to calculate the state. And unfortunately, it's it's a kind of reporter that you cannot run on the whole. Um, yeah, so we we're doing simulations here for a whole year, but you can't run them in parallel uh, for each day. You have to really go from left to right um, because the end state uh, needs to be taken into account for the next day. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, Maybe also a distinction about this that uh, what we did not do was to actually optimize the scheduler to uh, to generate as much certificate value as possible, but basically taking that into account as a, another um, economic way to, to make a better result of the schedule. We basically just in hindsight uh, computed how much uh, certificates could we generate this way to uh, add another layer of economic output after the optimization. It, yeah. It would also be possible to actually, I mean, I think with one of these PRs that are out there, with we, we can now stack multiple kinds of commitments and maybe the scheduler then will be soon ready to optimize for that also. But I think we can, we don't know at this point. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's interesting because uh, because this is quite a, yeah, quite an incentive, these uh, renewable fuel units. I can imagine that it's, yeah, it can, how do you say this? Um, uh, can can make a kind of the business case for maybe a larger battery. Um, so yeah, interesting. We'll try to find time to work on that uh, as for our service offerings. It can also be very interesting. That's that's true. We actually one of our focuses is uh, charging hubs to to work more with um, multiple electric vehicles which we have done in some simulations, but actually I think there's another PR with what we call multi-asset work. Right now, the safest thing to do is to uh, to start working with flex measures that you have one flexible asset mm. and the work is going to be published soon that um, you can safely run this multiple and then run it up across 10 cars. And then this renewable uh, branch of energy thing becomes more important. Yeah. I want to uh, highlight one question from the chat. 
Sunil has a bad network connection and he would like to have a little bit more information about this VPP thing I mentioned. Um, sorry, I, I just opened that link. I thought I can. Before before you open that link, I just want to get one more comment in regarding to the renewable fuel units. Mm -hmm. um, I do remember that we actually ran this uh, reporter on the realized schedules, um, but taking into account the value uh, of these renewable fuel units in the scheduler is another task, right? And that, that is also something that we haven't done yet. Okay. Um, let me just share my screen very quickly. So there is some information out there about the algorithm that we are going to build into flex measures that is uh, potentially more of a, a VPP, has more of a VPP um, it, it is less about just your own economic uh, optimization, which the storage schedule is doing, and more about a fleet, managing a fleet and, and ask the fleet to give you um, a joint outcome. Uh, here, it's the window I want to I cannot go into the algorithm a lot. We've been actually spending a day at TNO's offices. So TNO is a big uh, research organization in the Netherlands lots of technical knowledge, and they have done uh, this algorithm uh, years ago as part of a huge European research project. Um, I guess it's mentioned here somewhere. And, yeah, Interflex Horizon project. And this website of, of the actual engine is rather short on details. The flexibility is complex mathematic module detail you know that doesn't really tell you what it is we, we've seen some more insight into how it really computes what every single asset in the fleet in the VPP could contribute to a common goal for instance an aggregator perspective an aggregator says i have the economic possibility to take part in the imbalance market in a few minutes or i've been asked by the uh, dso to help out with the local congestion problem and if I could generate uh, a difference in my profile of uh, you know, 100 kilowatts over the next 10 minutes, I would be rewarded. Can we do this fleet? And then the fleet goes into multiple iterations of calculating what everybody could contribute and uh, trying to reach that goal. So that's a different algorithm than the linear programming approach that we are um, following. The Interflex project is also the whole project where that was a part of is finished. It was even finished a couple of years ago. And the reason why we are now getting extra funding to get this algorithm into flex measures is because this is an innovation that lies dormant after it has been funded. That happens a lot. And actually, I gave a lightning talk at the LF Energy Summit about that motivation being the um, carrying this, this integration work, which is going to happen uh, in the next couple of months. And I guess I can say that this is also, this is also inspired by this S2 protocol that um, PNO has been co-developing here. It was still called the Energy Flexibility Interface Protocol, uh, inspired by USEF, but it's really, I think, um, a very interesting standard. We open that website too. It's now called S2. Uh, it's now already a European standard. And CITA with and uh, outside of flex measures is one of the parties doing the first implementations. Daniel, is that the information you were looking for? Yes, it was. Thank you very much. All right. All right we do have uh, another 10 scheduled minutes. Um, there's no questions. I, I would like to know if uh, everybody has been uh, uh, 
expecting something else or ex exactly this and what might be wishes for another session some other day. I have a quick little question, which is uh, not uh, I wanted to do something differently, but it's maybe I don't understand a, a certain things. So I've been reading up about inflexible devices and I haven't been using them and I might be missing something. So can someone give me a, 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 a very simplistic uh, use case where a flexible device would add value? An inflexible device. So that's yes. Um, we use that in the in the toy tutorial, for instance, when uh, you can already see it with the solar power is coming in. And I think it's really simple. It's just uh, a way for us to tell the scheduler that this exists, and uh, and if it has forecasts like the solar power, then it needs to be taken into account as an existing. Um, well, series of consumption or production that will influence the end result. So the scheduler stays within the constraints that has been given to them because this uh, outside um, uh, device slash sensor is affecting uh, if those constraints are hit or not. Right. Yes. Part of the problem in my also. Also, uh, crucially, and I think this may touch upon your earlier issue or the discussion we had, um, it also influences the point at which the grid connection switches from consumption to production. And that influences which prices are being um, assigned. That's interesting because sort of most of I guess if you, I mean, devices that you control uh, and you make a schedule before, I can see that you pass them in because now you have sort of, you, you have made a schedule for a device and you want a second device maybe to take that into account. But when you say grid connection, there are so many, uh, I mean, you could pass in a forecast of the grid connection. I guess you could. Mm -hmm. But uh, aren't most inverters that control batteries, aren't they connected? So they, well, I guess the schedule doesn't necessarily know what happens in the future. But it sort of, are, are you thinking here of passing in the grid connection forecast? Yes, but in this case, it would be the, so if, if your flexible device is behind that grid connection and you have a, a couple of other inflexible devices also behind that grid connection. Um, what you want to do is pass in the, a, a sub power meter on all of those inflexible devices or on the, the whole group of inflexible devices. Right, but minus the battery. The main meter power uh, data, uh, power sensor, um, then you're double counting what the inverter of your battery is doing. Right. So if you have the, forecast on your main meter, you need to subtract the battery. Yeah, or at least, yeah. Okay, the sub meters is an interesting concept. I hadn't thought about that. That was useful. Thank you for that. Cheers. All right. And, and one more request about the uh, external ID um, question. Um, please also file a, a flex measures issue for that because it's, I think, a useful feature to uh, be able to search in the UI on an attribute. Um, and possibly this could also uh, um, serve the flex measures client. Okay, I'll good. write up a, 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 an, an issue or an uh, enhancement request. Perfect. Yeah, I want to add to that, that I think Ragnar, that case, as you said, is quite relevant because uh, we see that flex measures is, uh, well, it, it's part of a complete energy service, whatever that energy service is really doing in different parts of the world or the um, parts of sectors of e-mobility or heating or wherever. 
uh, and often it is actually something that is connected to an already existing system where the assets already exist. It might be a different company and like like we were just adding something smart to other companies uh, already existing solutions. It's it's by by design, I think, an, uh, an interesting thing that happens over and over. Um, and I don't have the perfect solution there in my mind as well. I don't have it. Just tracking these ideas might be the, the right thing, as you said, just maybe tracking visually and being able to see it. Uh, using similar names, of course, also nice. We've been recently improving um, the just l listing of things in the UI that have, those have, have been being very, you know, um, uh, primal, just sending everything out there. And then there's, there's data tables that you can also search. But if you have a lot of them, uh, these tables began to become very slow. So we, we sent too much stuff from the server to the browser. And uh, we're adding a lot of pagination now to the API and the UI is using the pagination to really efficiently show you this stuff, making, making that ex user experience nicer. Uh, some of it has been going out with version 0.23, but I think that some of that is still uh, yet to be released in version 0.24. I was just looking at this morning and I thought, mm, maybe we can do it within a week, but there's certainly one or two things that uh, I'd like to be part of version 0.24. Actually, that reminds me of one thing I wanted to mention that the, um, the this developer training is one thing that we do now for the first time um, to help others adopt flex measures and therefore build an ecosystem around flex measures of uh, people who use it uh, for the research or even professionally, which we now invest a lot in and hopefully comes back later to serve us as well. Um, but the other kind of a recurring event is the TSC, so that's the Technical Steering Committee, where um, everybody is also welcome. It's by design of the LF Energy governance model, a public meeting, but there's only a few people who have uh, voting power. So let's say uh, if the ecosystem exists and there's a couple of organizations really using flex measures in-house and some of them could be Come members of the official members, voting members of the TSC, and then in 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 those meetings we make joint decisions. For instance, what uh, design principle would we would use, or what's the next feature that should be absolutely prioritized, and, and so on. Um, but as I said, everybody's welcome. There is an LF Energy calendar that shows the next one. I had actually moved it from today to next week, so we are scheduled to do this uh, next Thursday. At this time, roughly, it's 5 p.m. European time. We usually do that quickly. It usually wraps up within half an hour. There's usually no need to, uh, to do a lot. And we usually try to uh, also uh, release a new version of flex measures around that time, which would give us a rhythm of every six weeks. But we, we do it sometimes and sometimes we fail. So looking at version 0.24 and the horizon of one week, I thought that maybe we don't get the nice features we want inside the next release. The features I want to release soon are that we um, have a, a nice UI way to edit the graphs you see for this on the asset dashboard that has been very cumbersome. You need to know about this one attribute sensors to show and then find out which sensors you really want to show. And this is now being developed into an actual UI clickable a way so that you can search which sensors should I show together so that I can show the data dashboard that I want to show. But of course, we discussed these other pull requests today that are about the scheduler, which uh, hopefully one can also make it into the, the actual version. So keep an eye on the calendar for, for technical steering committee, uh, whoever has time or is interested in finding out or just being up to date. Welcome. Um, and otherwise, oh yeah, Felix just point, uh, posted the, the link to that PR that uh, there's a bundle of two PRs that I think are very far. Mm. Yes, 
I, I think we can do these these sessions also regularly, um, but I'm not sure exactly what when the next should be, uh, how much interest there is, how to gauge the interest of you guys. Right now, I have two persons being uh, actively here and asking questions, or three actually, that's great. Um, from the others, uh, I would love to hear as well, like John is just posting here. Um, I, I understand that it's difficult to get into such a complex project from the beginning. And, and I hope we do enough to help you guys do that first couple of steps where even you know, Yelmer and Ragnar are still, but they have done the first steps and uh, they really understand the concepts. And well, I think I met Tanil in person, I think, and uh, he also proved to me he, he knows the concepts by now. But uh, do reach out because I think then uh, we reach an accumulating win-win situation once uh, this grows a little bit. That's it from my side. Thanks for coming. Uh, yeah, keep an eye on the on the LF Energy Slack also, and also on my LinkedIn. I, I think I, I sometimes call for these next meetings and have a great day, Ragnar, and a great evening, a lot of you. Bye-bye. Right, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.